Today is the conclusion, part three of three of the 1680 V2 Xeon, all the way back from 2013. If you guys haven't seen part one or part two, where we go over gaming numbers and then input lag, I'll put the links in the description below for you. But today is the productivity numbers. And essentially what we've done with these three CPUs is we've overclocked them to their max limits on water and air overclocks, at least in a 25 degree ambient environment where I can get them stable. And with that said, let's just get right on into these results. Welcome back to Tech Acid. And the first result I'm gonna throw up for you guys is the Premiere Pro 24 minute video file. It is a 4K video file, 25 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second max. And we are just rendering this out with no quick sync enabled. So the 9900K will have access to that quick sync uh, encoding if you wish to use that. So that is one benefit, but we're just gonna compare the eight cores versus the eight cores versus the eight cores with raw CPU performance. And at five gigahertz, the uh, 9900K did come out on top in this uh, battle here. The Xeon 1680 V2 and also the Ryzen 7 2700X were in similar ballparks here, scoring a little bit over the 26 minute mark. Uh, but honestly, these final render times for me personally, at least when I'm pressing that final render button, it's like a tea break where I can go have some time off. So it's not that important to me. Actually, more importantly was in the previous video where we're looking at the input delays while I'm working in terms of menu interaction and also cutting files. Now moving on to 7-zip, if you wish to compress or decompress files all day, then the good news here is that all three of these CPUs will do a phenomenal job. Uh, the AMD uh, 2700X and also the 9900K will do decompressing better than the 1680 V2, but the uh, 1680 V2 will do compressing better than both these counterparts. And uh, I do believe this has to do with the quad channel memory configuration, despite it still having uh, only the speeds at 1600 megahertz versus 3600 megahertz on both the AMD and Intel 2018 variants. But regardless, it is pretty sweet to see that 1680 V2 to score a victory over the 9900K. Next up in the suite, however, the 9900K was a bit angry from the 7-zip results, so it decided to give the uh, 1680 V2 a bit of a kidney shot and then throw V-Ray at it. Now I'm pretty sure this does utilize AVX2 instructions uh, because the V-Ray numbers show the 1680 V2 uh, falling clearly behind both the 9900K, which came out first, and then the 2700X, which was coming close to the 9900K. It was clearly lagging behind in this benchmark. And then moving over to the Corona benchmark, the 1680 V2 falling slightly behind the Ryzen 7 2700X and then the uh, 9900K coming out ahead uh, with one minute and 37 seconds. Moving over to Handbrake now, a program used to make uh, video files either larger or bigger or upscale or downscale. And this has some very good real world uses uh, with a 24 minute 4K file downscale to 1080p, also reduced in size. This took around 13 minutes and three seconds on the 9900K. Uh, moving over now to the 1680 V2, 15 minutes and 47 seconds. And then on the Ryzen 7 2700X, 16 minutes and two seconds. So pretty similar across the board. And then next up here, we have everybody's favorite Cinebench. And we saw the Ryzen 7 2700X coming out with a big 1,843 points, single score of 174, beating that of the 1680 V2, both on the multi and single threaded test. Uh, however, still falling behind the 9900K with its 2,145 and 217 on the single. And then next up we have Geekbench Multi, uh, which tests a lot of different things. After using this benchmark, I guess it's really a all-round usage if you're doing many different things on your computer. And here we saw the 9900K score 6,395 points single, 33,988. Uh, contrast that to the 1680 V2, that scored 4,622 and 30,478. And then we're looking at the Ryzen 7 2700X, 5,002, and then 28,487. So a little bit of a punch on there between the 1680 V2 and the Ryzen 7 2700X, the uh, AMD solution winning the single core, and then the uh, 1680 V2 winning the multi-core. And then last up here, now we have Time Spy Extreme coming in with a physics score for the 9900K of 5,317. Uh, looking at the AMD solution, that got 3,885. And then the poor Xeon got 3,664. However, I did have to uh, drop the uh, 2080 Ti's power limit when I tested the poor little Xeon 
because the actual whole system just clonked out while we're doing this benchmark. Uh, so in other words, the two PCIe cables on the power supply couldn't feed the graphics card enough power. Anyway, the conclusion with part three is pretty straightforward. I believe all three of these CPUs are more than capable of doing any sort of work you wish to throw at it, whether it be Premiere Pro, whether it be encoding videos with handbrake or rendering or making music or decompressing files or compressing them. They all do a phenomenal job in 2018. And when it comes down to if I change my 1680 V2 over to a 9900K, I'm really not gonna see much benefit at all. In fact, if you look at part two of this series, we even lose a little bit out in input lag where the 1680 V2 overall uh, did win uh, those benchmarks. But I guess in closing this video out, I I've been called many a things on Twitter or in the comments section about, hey, you're a dumpster diver, you should get back to the dumpster and uh, you know use that old Xeon hardware, it's outdated, it's crap. Uh, and I guess those arguments sort of, I guess now that this Xeon sort of, which been in my main rig for quite a while now, now that it's sort of the benchmarks have come out, I guess people are left scratching their head and they're saying, wow, a CPU from 2013 is still that good in 2018. So I guess those people have been silenced in ways because I guess they don't know how to uh, counteract the argument except for, oh, the price now. Suddenly this price performance argument comes out of nowhere. And I've got two of those Xeons for under $400. One which is in Yusuf, the video editor's rig, and another one which is in my main rig now, which does phenomenally well for what it is. At the end of the day, I love jumping into the BIOS, having all these extra voltages that are needed in order to get a 4.6 gigahertz overclock out of the Xeon, as opposed to the new school stuff, which is literally three different settings. Uh, for me, it's exciting. For me, it represents uh, what overclocking used to be about, as opposed to fast forwarding to 2018, where it's all pushed to the max envelope, as I said in part one, where uh, your CPUs are coming out more aggressively clocked closer to those limits than they've ever been before. And uh, so the value of overclocking really is diminishing. Uh, this represents the best value when it comes to overclocking those CPUs and getting the most performance out of them. And yes, before we end this video, Ryzen is phenomenal value for money. I haven't heard someone arguing against that. Um, and this is not the whole point of this series. The whole point of this series was to take technology that existed in 2013 and compare it to technology in 2018 and show that there really isn't a difference for someone like me and my workflow. And I guess a lot of other people out there who are single end power users. And of course the prices of these Xeons have gone up. And now if you're in the market for a 1680 V2, unfortunately they've gone up in price. And with that, they are now, I would consider them an exotic, but one that's still very, very contemporary in 2018 especially if you just want something different. Anyway guys, hope you enjoyed today's video and also the three part series. You guys have been requesting this one for a while and I hope I delivered for you. And of course, I can't wait for the Ryzen 3000 series announcements at CES. I'm just like any other tech enthusiast out there. I want innovation, I want better products, I'm hungry for it. And I hope you're hungry for the next video. Peace out for now, bye.